Hey, good morning. Um, do you, can you hear me or do I have to use this thing? I use it? You can hear me without this? Sometimes the sound is not very good with this thing, so I have to... Let me try it, okay? If it's not good, then we drop, we'll just drop it. All right. It's not very good. I hate my voice when I hear it like that. <laughs> it sounds like a, a machine voice or something. Anyway, I am... Uh, uh, there was a change in the, in the uh, class schedule, so it's not Mr. Omni who's going to teach group one, two, three, four, but it's me. Uh, and he's teaching for five, uh, five, six, seven, seven eight. So it's, this is just uh, to clear things up for those of you who are a little bit uh, confused about what's going to happen. Anyway, uh, we, I will, uh, as you can see, I call this beginning introduction. It's, uh, no, not that. <laughs> That's just the title. Uh, but the next slide will explain a few things about what I want to do. Um, Okay, it's a strange beginning, okay? Because when you start criticism, you don't know how to begin or where to begin from. Where do you go to? A few years ago, I was teaching this class and I started with going back over the history of criticism, all the way back to Plato and even before. It's like thousands of years of history and it's not easy because criticism has been there all the time. And there are lots of schools and different ways of thinking about it, etc. But it's, it's just very hard to, to find a good place to begin with. Right? Because it's complicated. And so what we have to do, like, you know, jump into it. Just like when you want to swim, you just go, you, you wait and you start like procrastinating. Should I go in or not? You're scared of the cold water or something, you just jump, right? You jump into the water. So this is like jumping into the pool to swim because it's complicated, right? Like I said, there are lots of concepts and then each concept has a history. If you start to learn the, concept, the history of the concept, you will never be able to finish that. It takes too long. So what I'm doing is instead of talking to you about theory, which is criticism, there's a lot of theory in it, it's based on theory, so it's very abstract, it's a lot of theoretical stuff, and, and it's not always accessible, especially for you as the students who just start, this is your first time uh, probably studying criticism. Uh, you've been practicing criticism, you've seen it in practice, but you have not seen it really as a, as a theory. So what we will do without the theory, right? I will do without theory so we can find a new way. This is a new way of doing things, exploring other ways of teaching criticism. And, 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 and I hope it's going to be, if you have any questions or any time, you can raise your hands or you can just talk. Don't worry about that. You can ask any questions you want, right? The point, the, the most important thing is that you learn something and that you understand what I'm trying to teach you. I do my best to make it easier, simpler, understandable and I will go step by step, and it does, and there is, it's a long journey and it has no end, and so the end is, is up to us. We can end it whenever we want, right? It's the end, it's us. So because you can never learn the whole thing about criticism, uh, you have to stop somewhere. So we will go as far as time allows us to go, and, as time, as, and also as long, as, as, as far as your interest goes. <laughs> If you lose interest, we stop, and we do something else. We change it totally, yeah, the whole thing, and then we do something else, okay? Now, with what I call strange beginnings, it's uh, because we're, the question is, uh, where and when does a, a library text begin? I will start with very simple questions. When you read a, a poem or a novel, does the poem or the novel or whatever it is, or short story starts at the first word? Or does it start with the title? Or does it start with, uh, for example, for a novel, for example, let's take a novel. Mm -hmm. This is the novel that I'm probably, I don't know, some of you have studied with me, I don't know. But for example, does it start with this? Or with this? Or this? And this again? 
and this and this because this is all these things exist. They are part of the book. You cannot guess. And and this and then there is the this. And finally you, you get to here and you have a name and you have the narrative that starts. Right? But these things are also part of it too. And so what is the beginning? Is it here or is it before? Even you know, even so, I mean even without this. You take for example something like I will give you something that's a Right, John Milton. How many of you have heard about John Milton? John Milton is a 17th century English poet. He's very famous, he's really a big time, right? He's a very, one of the major poets in English literature. And he wrote this, this big thing called Paradise Lost. It's an epic, it's a long poem, it's a book. It's a long poem, it's called Paradise Lost. And basically it's about it starts with the fall of Adam from heaven and uh, the continuation of it, and with, with the hope that humans will return to heaven again because it's, it's called the fall and the fall is like a negative thing. Like falling from something nice to something worse. You know, it's not good at all. It's like a fall from grace, if you want. The grace of God, in other words, right? Okay, so... When you look at this, the, the, it's, it's English, it's 17th century English, so it may be a little bit complicated to read, so you, you, you have to be patient with it, and it says, of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree, whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe, with loss of Eden, till one greater man restores us, restore us, and regain the blissful seat, we have not even started yet. The poem hasn't started <laughs> with this, because the sentence is long and we haven't seen that it's of the beginning of man's first disobedience. You see that, the, that beginning? But you're still waiting for something to come, because it starts with of, of man's first, so what? Then you have to come to the one, two, three, four, five, sixth line, then the verb comes. Sing heavenly views that on the secret top again. So that, that's the part. Sing of sing all heavenly or sing heavenly muse. You know what's a muse? The muse. Alright. <laughs> the muse poets in, in the past, I mean maybe even in the present. Poets thought huh? Eh? Yes. It's a source of inspiration. A muse is like a, a, a what can I call it? It can be something like, uh, it, it has different shapes, it can be anything, but it's, it's, it's basically an imaginative or an imaginary being, it could be a woman or whatever, that inspires the poets to write poetry. The inspiration, the muse. In Arabic, they call it shaitan shair. Remember that? Have you studied Arabic poetry yeah. in high school? Yeah. Was well, part of a high school program? Oh, maybe you were in the science. So the, if, you, if you did science, you did not have that. But they call it shaitan asher. It's good, shaitan. <laughs> poetry is inspired by shaitan. <laughs> That's probably why a lot of people don't like it. But it's it's just uh, you know it's a metaphor for something that inspires the poet to to say poetry because. Poets in the past did not sit down and write their poetry on paper. They just sang it. They were so good, they were so great. They have this great concentration and they have this command of language that when, for example, take Al Mutanabbi. You know Mutanabbi? You heard about Mutanabbi? Or, I don't know, any other poets that you know. When they start, saying their poetry because they don't read it, they say it. They, don't, they did not go home, no, sit home and write it down and then read it. No. They even had in Okad, right? Okad, you heard about Okad? Huh? This uh, Suq Okad was in, in Mecca, I think, where, where poets come to do competitions of who is going to be the most eloquent poet. And so they have competitions. Who can come with the best poetry? And it was improvisational. But it has to follow the rules. There were rules for poetry. 
So you can't just say anything, right? There are people there who are sitting and they are listening to what you're saying and they will be, you know, right? It's exactly like the voice <laughs> or those shows that you see on TV, like Americans Got Talent or uh, Arabs Got Talent or whatever it's called. Those, it's the same. Well, except those people are saying what other people have sung. But in poetry, I mean, these people are saying their own poetry. And there, are, there is a jury who are you know, giving them marks on every aspect of, their, of, their, of what they say. So it was believed, and they, it, it's part of a tradition, that they invoke, that they call, and use the muse to um, inspire them. So Milton here is beginning, because when he says that, it's the topic of the, of the, the whole poet is that, is in the first few lines. Of man's, first, of man's first disobedience, and the fruit, of, you, 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 you know the, the references? Man's first disobedience is Adam's disobedience, because God told him not to eat from a certain tree, and he disobeyed and he ate from it. This is the version of the Bible, not of the Quran. The Quran is a little different. Uh, and the fruit of that forbidden tree, because it was forbidden, whose mortal taste, the mortal taste, I mean, is the taste that brings death. Right? It says, brought death into the world. In other words, death did not exist in heaven. Doesn't, death doesn't exist in heaven. But the moment Adam disobeyed and tasted from the tree and ate from the tree, he became mortal. He became, you know, a person who dies. Because he was thrown from, from heaven to earth, and in earth, you know, everything dies. Right? And so that's, for him, the beginning of death for, the, for Milton. He says, these people brought death. You know, this first disobedience, in, um, in, usually in, in Christian tradition, they call it the original sin. The original sin is the one committed by Adam and Eve, the disobedience of God, right? disobedience of the command of God. Right? And so that's, uh, that's what it refers to. And our woe and our uh, suffering, suffering. The woes are like troubles. Huh? Pain, sorrow, suffering, etc. Those are the things that brought misery to humans. It says from that moment, humanity has become uh, miserable, right? Not, not, you know, mortal, miserable, not good. So we have to do everything we can so that you can go back to heaven. So that's like a circle, right? So he said, and all our well with loss of Eden, loss of the you know Garden of Eden is Adam, you know, Jannah to Adam in Arabic, Jannah to Adam or something, right? Till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Till one greater man. Who's the greater man in Christianity? Greater man is yes, it's Jesus. In in, in Christianity, is Christ who will restore humanity back. To heaven. Through him, people will go back to heaven. This is, this is a question point. And so, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, the, you know, the happy seat, the place where we were before, the heaven. And then, that of all this, he asked the heaven, the, asked the muse to inspire him or to sing for him because he was, he's, he's not even saying inspire, just say sing. Sing heavenly muse, all heavenly muse. In other words, he's addressing the, the heavenly muse, what we call the heavenly muse, to sing of this. Okay? So that's, this is the beginning of the poem. That on the secret top of Oreb or Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seeds, etc. So I put things in, in italics if you can see them, because these are words that refer to a beginning, the first beginning of something. Right? From the first, you see that first disobedience? I put first in italics there. Because it's supposed to be the first. So this is a poem that starts with this, but it doesn't really start with this. You know what I mean? It starts 
before. It refers to things before the poem. In other words, the poet did not create anything. He's using things that are already there. Right? The first disobedience right, is something that is independent of him. So he's going to think of something that supposedly happened the first time ever. Right? Then the whole story of Adam and Eve and the fall from heaven itself is not his creation. It's something in the Bible. It's a religious text. So it's already there before even he began to talk. Right? So when, when you think about the beginning of a poem or a literary work of art, a literary work, uh, we're talking about the beginning. Are we talking about the beginning as the first line, the first words that are written here, or the things that come into it? Because these are things that from outside the poem are in the poem. So where do we begin? If you are poets, for example, imagine yourself you're writers, and you want to write about something. You write about something. You write about your past, your friends, whatever it is that you write about. We call it writing because you start writing, but when you start writing, the story has already preceded you. The story that you want to write is already out there before you, before you start the act of writing. So where does, this, so where does the writing begin? Is it with you or before you? Do you understand this? Right? This is very important in understanding that really works. It's very important to know the context. In other words, beginnings are always contextual. There is always a context. It never starts out of nowhere. Nothing comes out of nothing. Nothing comes out of nothing. We don't write in a vacuum, in a place without, with nothing in it. I mean, uh, poets can create, uh, you know, uh, writers can create something that didn't exist in their writings. If our poets talk about things that already existed, they did not, I didn't see a poet talk about things that don't exist. Mm -hmm. And writers do, you think? Writers uh, can create a story that doesn't exist about some, someone or something. Or yeah. A fiction, a fiction, a fiction, right? If you write fiction, you are creating something new, right? You are creating something that doesn't exist. But poets always talk about like, things like joy, sorrow, and... But when you, write, when you write fiction with a short story or novel, do you really write from nothing? No. But Where does the story come from to you? You imagine the story, but how does your imagination work? How did, how, did, how did it come to your head? You refer to things, you refer to people, you refer to events, to cities, to places, etc. that are already there. Plus, you only write if you have read stories. You can't, if you have never read a story in your life, it, it's hard to imagine someone writing having never written, read, read a word, right? So when you write stories, for example, you want to write a short story, but before even you came to this, before you came to the university and started studying English and read about short stories, probably you have never heard about short stories. And so there is an influence somewhere. You have read, I don't know what short stories you've read, but there is an impact that, you know, there is an influence in there. Right? You did not write from a vacuum, you did not write from nothing. You started with something that you already seen. You're not copying it, of course. But even the idea of writing itself comes only after being subjected to writing or to reading what other people have written. Have written. And so there is always this problem of where do we really begin? When you write, for example, you, you I don't know, does, it, does anybody write here? Anybody tries writing something, right? What do you write? Short stories. Short stories. But you have read short stories before. So is there any short story that uh, inspires you or that made you want to read? What, what made you want to write short stories in the first place? I was bored. Hmm? I was bored. You were, <laughs> you're bored. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. You started writing because you were bored? Uh-huh. But when you started writing, you your short story that you write is, is a form that exists, you know, that we, we call it genres, you know, there is, it's a genre, right? You have short story, you have the novel, you have 
uh, poetry, you have uh, drama, etc. These are genres, right? But you're writing within a genre with a limited thing because you know that a short story is like a few pages, maybe one to ten pages long. I'm not yeah. trying to write poetry, mm -hmm. but it's too long. Yeah. I've, I've read some, uh, some books like The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. Yeah. Paradise Lost and uh, the, the Divine Comedy. Right. It's yeah. Too long. Yeah, well, you can, yeah. It's, uh, you went to the big ones, <laughs> the hard ones too. Uh, and so the idea is that the first disobedience of Adam and Eve is supposed to be a first event. And so because the poem talks about it, then the poem talks about something that began before it, before the poem. Just follow this logic. The poem also has a beginning itself, right? So we have multiple beginnings. The poem itself, these first lines are supposed to be the first lines of the poem. But those first lines refer to something that is supposed to be an absolute beginning, something that happened somewhere, sometime, right? Even if it's mythology, it doesn't matter, but it did happen, it's somewhere, even if it's imaginative. But he's bringing it from something else and somewhere else and inserting it into his text, and so it becomes something that is added in the story. So it, it, like, it defers the beginning. So we say, oh, is this the beginning? No, but then imagine that you don't know the references here. You have no idea what the first beginning is. Uh, first beginning, the, the first disobedience of Adam and Eve. You have no idea, you've never heard about that. Then you will ask a question. The first disobedience of Adam and Eve, who is this? Right? It says, yeah, he doesn't say that, he said first disobedience, right? Uh, the fruit of that forbidden tree. These are all enigmatic. If you don't know the story, you will be enigmatic. Listen to him, what is this? then you will be looking for it. You'll go look for books, uh, go to the internet and you know, check those things, see what they mean. And then you will be reading about them. You will find yourself, to understand these first few lines, you have to go and read about the Bible. Right? So the beginning of the poem sent you to an earlier beginning because you have to read other books in order to, to begin this poem. I'm sorry? When did the, the first writer in this world came with his ideas? He did uh, read, read books. Who? Right. Milton? No, the first writer. Who's the that first writer? You know. We don't know the first uh, writer. What is the so, so well, there is a lot of first things here. There is the first, the first, uh, the first uh, disobedience yeah. refers to uh, something in, in, in heaven, right? It's like the origin, the beginning of the beginning of history, human history if you want, or the creation, right? And then you have a first, another first knowledge about this because then there we have another person here what we call an, um, the, uh, that shepherd, he says, that it inspired that shepherd, the first thought, the chosen seed, which is a reference to, to, huh? Sorry? No, no, I'm talking about him. This, this, that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning. Yes. Huh? No, this is n n before. <laughs> no, Moses, Musa. The prophet Musa. Right? Moses, also. So they have lots of beginnings. Who first taught. See, that's first there. So every word that comes with first, it's like pushing that beginning further and further, right? So we have that first sort of beginning, then you have that of uh, Jesus, and then we send this over to, to Moses, etc. And so each time we are sent back to look for, an, for the beginning. Because the poem is lines, the poems are lines, they're words on the page. But those words on the page refer to something outside of the page. Right? They refer to history, to religion, to stories, to things that happen, to different famous people. And so, in order to read the poem, you find yourself obliged to go outside, to leave the poem aside and take books and your computer and go to the internet and find information on those words. Right? So the poem does not start with the poet words in the page, but it starts with a whole historical context. And those things are all coming into the poem. Because when you read it, you find yourself 
having to go and look for other things outside of the page that you're reading. Otherwise, you will read it and it will not make sense. All right? So let's go on. And, uh, so, so the opening sentence there is itself a beginning, um, asking the muse for inspiration. And so the poem itself has not even begun yet, has not even begun yet. If the poet is asking the muse for inspiration, he's asking her to sing, right? He says, sing heavenly muse of, of this. So he hasn't started yet, because he will start only once he gets inspiration from the muse. So the poem begins without beginning, or the beginning is not really the beginning. And so we get again into these circles and circles of beginnings, which never end. It's problematic. Now, this is to show you the complexity of literary works and of also things that we take for granted sometimes. Just a beginning is an absolute beginning. We think of a, you take a novel by, I don't know, Colleen Hoover, <laughs> for those of you who know this author, and you start reading. And for you, the beginning is where she starts to write the first words and the first event that she describes, right? But it's not as simple as that. This is your beginning of criticism. This is how you began to practice criticism. By thinking that things don't, are not what they appear to be. So the beginning of this poem appears to be a beginning, but it's not the real beginning. The beginning is somewhere else. It's outside, or it's not even yet there. And both. It's outside, it's there, it's not there, and it hasn't begun. It sounds crazy, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's there because you have the first lines. Just follow, just think, all right? It's there because we have the first lines of the poem, right? That's the beginning of the poem. But it's not, that's not the real beginning because the real beginning is a story that began a long time ago, right? And then when you know this, you say, okay, so what's next? The poet, tell, the poet tells you, while well, he's still waiting for the muse to inspire him to say the poem. The poem. So the poem is still, you know, still in the next pages. You, know, you have to read more to follow. All right? Are you confused enough? <laughs> Give me some responses. Don't just sit there. How is it? Are you confused? No? Is it clear? I think I made it clear. I don't know. If it's not clear, just let me know, okay? Raise your hand, tell me it's not clear, and I will explain again. All right? Yes? You're good? Vale? Vale. Let's <laughs> say so Spanish. OK. So <clears throat> you see, the, the syntax of the sentence itself is complicated, because it, it, starts with lots, it starts with the object, and it ends with the, the verb and the subject. See, of the first, of, of man's first disobedience, then the sentence and sing, uh, or sing heavenly muse, right? The, the subject and the verb, the verb first, then the subject. The syntax is completely, you know, but that's poetry, right? In poetry, you're allowed to break the syntax the way you want. I mean, as long as it creates something good. So, um, this is, so this is a paradoxical beginning, but we call it a paradoxical beginning. It's a paradox because the beginning is before the beginning. The beginning of the poem is not the beginning of the poem. It started before the poem. In other words, these stories and these references that he sends us to look for, right? To, to understand. So what is the origin of the poem then? Is it the poet himself who's the, uh, who, who creates the poem? Or is it somebody else, something else, somebody else, etc. that's there? But can this text, this text that we have, that Paradise Lost, can it be there if there was no one called Milton? If Milton hasn't existed? Yes. No. <laughs> because Milton is the one who wrote it. If there was no Milton, then there would be no Paradise Lost, no, no, no poem. Uh, I'm sorry? Huh? <laughs> Yes. 
Yeah. And that's why it's going to the end. Yeah, that's what the poem is saying. But I'm saying if the, the text itself, the poem, as we know it, right? The several, I don't know how many pages poem is long. It's, long. it's a really big book. That poem, the epic that has been written and published. Huh? Somebody sat down and took his pen and started writing on paper this thing, right? Is he the origin? The question was, who is or what is the origin of the, of the poem? Is it the author who wrote it? Well, you know, common sense would say yes, because there was a man who is known, historically known, and we have his biography and we know everything about him, whose name is John Milton, who lived in the 17th century, and he one day published a poem called Paradise Lost, and so everybody refers to him, so we know. But at the same time, he is the originator, yes, he wrote it. But at the same time, when you read all this, and even himself, he doesn't say, I am the creator of all this. He's asking the muse for inspiration. He is telling her to tell him about something that is already there before him. So the origin of the poem is, he wrote it, but he refers to something that's even beyond the whole thing, beyond the poem itself. And so the origin, the, the, the origin of the poem also is problematic, right? Even though we recognize the author, we know the author was there, the poet was there and he wrote it down, but then is it something that he created out of it? It's not like God, you know? We, we know and we learned that God created the universe out of nothing, right? Yes? That's what you learned in the Quran. No, I'm talking about the text and what's in the text, right? The text, as we see it, as a material thing, as, as paper, as, as words on paper, as we say, but at the same time, things that are outside of the poem. And so, <clears throat> the author is responsible for the text. The poet is responsible for the text, but he is not responsible for all the things that's been outside of the text. He uses them. He is responsible for its use, for the use of the information and then the, the history, the references, etc. that he uses. But he is not responsible for the existence of those sources. Are you following? So which makes the origin of the text. This is what you learn. Normally, in a, in a normal class of literary criticism, I would come and tell you about, about the theory that says that the, the author is dead, that there is no author. Or, and we'll talk about that. Uh, for example, this is part of structuralism where they say the death of the author by a French uh, critic whose name is Roland Barthes. I will talk about that later. And so, but you have to see it in practice. You have to see what that means in practice. Right? And in practice, it's this. You take a poem and you look for beginnings and you look for origins and you find that origins and beginnings are hard. And you're not just looking for beginnings just for that. Because if you know the beginnings and origins of a text, you understand what is a text. And you understand the complexity of a text. For example, we talk about the concept of intertextuality, intertext. And intertextuality means a text made up of other texts. Every text is made up of other texts. That's why I said you don't write from a vacuum. You don't, um, you don't create from nothing. Only God created from nothing, right? That's what the story, that's what the religion tells us. God created the world out of nothing. But as humans, we create things out of things. You make a tree, you make a, a chair from wood that comes from a tree. You don't make it up, you don't say fiat lux, like they say in the Bible. The Bible says that God created the world when he said, the world when he said fiat lux, that means let there be light, and light was there, right? It's not like magic, <laughs> right? We have to work something else. We have to work with what we have. And so intertextuality is basically the idea that every text is composed of other texts, even if the author himself is not aware of it. Like when you write your short stories, you're not, you're not conscious and you don't care. And who cares, after all? <laughs> that you are using forms, using structures that exist in other short stories that you have read before, even if you're not copying the words, even if you're not copying the plot line or the storyline. You're just creating a new story, 
but because you have read short stories before. You write a novel because you have read novels before. You write theater because you have seen theater or read theater before. Singers are the same. You don't sing out of nothing. You know, people are copying each other's sing you know, you see, for the singers, they even do the, what they call sampling, right? Which is basically just taking someone's uh, tunes and using it and add a few things and make your own song out of someone's work. Which probably he also took it from somebody else before him or before her, right? Yes? About the same thing. Yeah. Well, like for example, what? Uh, can I write a book? About criticism and not having read criticism? Yeah. Well, it would be your book, yeah. But I don't know if anybody would read uh, it. Can, can someone write a book <laughs> uh, just uh, with his imagination? Of course, yes, reading. without imagination, but what, like what? For example, and a story? Like a fiction? Yeah, a story based on uh, his or her experience. Yes, yeah, of course you can do that. Because you can say uh, that. Yeah. Uh, their, their ideas from. Ah, for example, you're talking about like, let's see, what is the first known novel? There are lots of you know theories about what is the first book that has been written completely like that. Al Fiyar you know, you know Al Fiyar you know, right? So set of stories. It's considered one of the first you know written texts in history, in human history. But Al Fiyar you know, it was written was not written, was oral, right? So it's made up of stories that have been like there for a long time and somebody put them down, you know, put them on paper, right? For example, let's take another story. Uh, the first, one of the first known novels is called uh, Don Quixote by Cervantes, a Spanish person called Miguel de Cervantes. But when he writes his novel, he did not write it out of nothing. He wrote because he used to read stories. And he was to imitate and mock and parody, you know, and make fun of stories of, of, uh, of knights fighting monsters and saving women and children. And so he would, in order to make fun of that, he used this old guy who has been reading so many books. See, every time you have a, de a deferral, like pushing forward the thing, Miguel de Cervantes is writing a story about uh, about, you know, the chivalry, right? Like the spirit of chivalry is when there is this man who is, you know, noble and good, saves other people. He's brave, courageous, fights the evil and, and helps the, 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 the weak and, and, and the poor. And so those stories existed before. And so he's using, but he says that his own character has read those stories too. And so, who read those stories? Is it the character, Don Quixote? Or is it Miguel de Cervantes himself, the writer, the real man, the human being that exists? So, whichever way you look for it, you, you know, it's impossible. You, you, can, you, you can't say you can write a story without having ever written, having read a book in your life, or written text. It doesn't have to be a book, but it has to be text. If you've, if you've heard stories, you write from the stories that you heard. Because there is in you this thing that exists that are called stories. And stories, you have heard them, you have read them, it doesn't matter, but stories exist. Yes? I mean, uh, one of the remarkable writers, I, I don't remember his name, Shukri. Mohammed Shukri, yeah. yeah. He wrote the book of the, the time. Mm -hmm. But he lived, he was illiterate. Hmm? He was illiterate, he didn't. No, he was not. He started learning That's when he started writing. Yeah. yeah, and when he started writing and he started learning Arabic and started school late in, in his life, he, it's after going to, I mean, after learning, after going through this late education, right, that he wrote the book, not before. Because before he didn't know how to write. He didn't know the book based on other books. But what did he study then when he was a student? <laughs> the book itself talk, talks about his experience. Yeah, exactly. But it's, he's not the only one who wrote about his experiences. Tahseen wrote about his experiences. You know, Ayyam? Yeah. Huh? Well, he wrote about his life. 
But you can write uh, about your And how do we know that uh, that Muhammad Shukri, when he was going to school, when he was learning, you know, his school, learning all of these things, was interested actually in literature and he was reading books? Oh, you don't need uh, other books to write about my own experience. Uh, I can write about my experience without education. W without education? No, uh, not uh, necessarily without. How do you, know, how do you learn about narrative, for example? Narrative. Narrative style. How do you learn it? Yeah, because you have read stories, you have read texts at school, right? When you go to school and you read the text in Arabic or in French or in English or whatever, and you start and, you know, uh, trying to analyze it and getting the ideas and looking at the grammar, looking at the form of the sentences, you are learning the narrative style. But I'm talking idea, not No, the idea is something different. But the, the ideas come with the, Can you separate the, the words from the ideas? Huh? No. The, the ideas come with language. You can't have ideas without language. Even when you think, you don't think without language. Have you ever thought without language? You can't. Even your dreams come in words or images. But you can't think in images. When you want to write your story, you don't think in images. You think in words. I don't know. So then you can, can you write images without using words? No, no. So you're back to language. And because words is something that you have learned, and the grammar is something you have learned, syntax is something you have learned, the, the narrative style is something that you have learned, and you are using them to write in this. And so the influence, and the language is not yours, after all, right? You're not using your own language. You're using a language that you were born into, or that you learned, that exists before you. Language precedes us. We don't exist. When you were born, language was there. You did not create your own language. Like I said, it's like, a, it's like a, a pool. It's there, you just jump into it. Or like a river, right? The river is always flowing. The language is like a river, it's there. It's flowing all the time. And so when you want to go into the river, you take your boat and jump into the river with the boat and go with the, with, and go with the, with the, with the stream, with the current, right? It's already there. So language is before us, precedes us, and shapes us, and shapes our way of thinking. You can't think without language. It's impossible to think without language. All right? So these are the problems with beginning novels. So now we start with doing, we have to, now this conversation has, spoken, has without mentioning them, we've talked about so many issues in literary criticism right there. For example, the, 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 the language, language and thought, right? How do we think about language? Can we think without language? Right? Does language shape our thinking? If you think in English, is it the same as if you think in Arabic? Right? Your sentences are not the same. Right? English words bring you something different that is, may not exist in Arabic. And so it makes you think in a certain way, based on your knowledge of the language and of the things that come with that language, the culture, the ideas, the history, everything you learned in that language, come into your text. And so that's like this, like this guy, you know, bringing all of these ideas that come from other texts that he was educated in, right? And so he's using them. But as readers, we have to pay attention to all these things. We, we don't say, for example, we've talked about so many things, but language is not supposed to be transparent. Does language copy reality? Is language, can language give you a clear uh, representation of reality? of something, of someone. For example, you want to talk to me about someone, I don't know, whoever it is. About your uncle, your friend, etc. Huh? It's not transparent. Yeah, because whatever you tell me, I can never imagine that person. I mean, I can imagine it my own way, but I may be wrong. If I see the person, I have imagined somebody is completely different. Can you describe someone? For example, the police, you know when they do that uh, sketch with the, for, for example, for criminals? And before they send the pictures, they don't have pictures, they don't know, so they ask, but how does he look? What does he have? So you have to ask like 10 or 20 people in order to come closer to something that may you know, remotely resemble the real person. And so they post it and say, if you see someone that is closer to this, please tell us or arrest them if you want. <laughs> but it could be anyone. <laughs> it's not always working, it doesn't work all the time. So language is not transparent. Language is not like a, like a window. 
you can see you can see behind the window, you can see through the window what's outside, but language does not give you that possibility. If I talk about grass, the grass is green, of course the grass is green, but you can imagine because you've seen the grass. Huh? But if you have never seen the grass, imagine you tell someone who lives in the desert has never seen grass in his life, and you tell them, oh, the grass is really good, it's very, very, very green. How? What? What does it look like? <laughs> right? If you haven't seen it, you will never be able to imagine the world. Can we make language transparent by, uh, uh, by seeing or hearing a lot of perspectives? Uh, no, you can never make it. Even if you get all perspectives, it's never transparent. Like uh, those people who, uh, who draw yeah. the faces of the criminal, mm -hmm. they, uh, they ask a lot of people. Right. But they never get the real picture. They get something close, maybe, or something, but not really the thing. Like I said, if you tell me about your friend or someone, I will never be able to imagine their real face. I have to see the real face to see what it is, but I will never imagine it in myself. It's hard. Right? It's the same about the story, something that happened. For example, you are in the streets and you witnessed uh, an accident, or something happened in the street. And then you come here to tell us what happened. I saw this and this and this and this. But then it just happens that there is another person on the other side who saw the same thing. And we ask that same person, or we get a different version of the same event. You ask another person again, you will get a completely different version. So we will never have one version of an event. Because the event is brute, is brute right? It's in brutality. It happens and that's gone. That's it. It's very immediate. Once it happens, it cannot happen again. Unless you film it. Even if you film it, it's still not the same. So, when something happens, it's already gone. So, an event or reality is twice removed. I mean, it's like two times distanced, distanced, put in a distance. One by time, because it's, it happened in the past, so we can't go back. So it's already gone. And the second one, it comes to us through language. That's another postponing of the event itself, or some deferral of the event. We defer it, we push it back, because, and then the event disappears. And all you have is versions of the event, which can be contradictory, which can be not clear, not complete, etc. And so language is not transparent. Language can never give you the real thing. If I say a tree, you can imagine any tree, and you will not imagine the same trees. You will imagine, a, I don't know, a, an eucalyptus tree, and the other person will, for example, a pine, that one is like a maple, another one is argan, and I don't know. You can <laughs> imagine all kinds of trees, but you will never imagine the same tree, right? That's why, for example, we say signified and signifier. You heard about these things. The signified is the tree. The signifier is the word, right? But which tree? When you say tree, huh? Yeah, well, I mean, you can imagine a tree, but you're not imagining the same tree. It depends on the perspective. Yeah, and so, because we have different perspectives and we have different imaginations and different, you know, things, different minds, the reality is diffused. What is the tree? Which tree? No, not this one. Not this one. Not this one. Not this, I don't know. All of them at the same time. I have no idea. See, you see, it's complicated. That's why I say language is not transparent. It doesn't give you, say, tree is not this tree or that tree, but it's a tree. It's just a, a general concept of a tree. What kind? You can never transmit a real image? Yeah. yeah. Which, yes, exactly, because it, once it's gone, it's gone, it's, it's finished, right? Unless it's something like uh, that's there all the time, like a building or something you can go and see, right? Uh, a monument. You say I'm talking about uh, Bab Mansour uh, in Knas, and you can go and see Bab Mansour, it's there. So whatever I say, you can measure my description against the reality of Bab Mansour, and say, well, you, you did not describe as well. <laughs> Or say, oh, your description was really good, etc. So it depends on how you know you can describe it. I mean, yeah. But events, things that are that are fleeting, you know, like a person, like a things that happen, uh, those are things that go, and, and it's hard to 
to grasp them. Are you the same you were 10 years ago, yourselves? Are you the ones who were 10 years ago? No. You're not going to be in the future who you are now. I am not the one who was a student. I, can even ident I cannot even identify myself. I only have memories of myself when I was a student like you. But it's so far removed. That's why sometimes people will say, I was like that? Oh my god. You know, people don't like their pictures. For example, when you're a kid, you look at it, ah, that was me? No. <laughs> See, so we have, it's the, which is a question of identity. Is identity fixed? Once and for all, never. It's fluid. It changes. I am not who I was last year. Every year, every time, I am changing. And we are changing. Not just, more, not just uh, intellectually or spiritually or morally or mentally. Even physically we change. You grow up, you grow old, etc. You change, your physical appearance change, etc. It's never the same. Okay? So it's life. Okay? Let me go on. Okay? So um, we have this poem here. It's, it troubles, it disturbs the idea of a beginning. Because it sends us to lots of beginnings. And we start looking, and this is, the, this is the work of criticism, is when you start looking for those beginnings, when you look at the text and see things and say, well, this comes from somewhere, I want to check it. And so you go out and start reading about it to find, it's, a, it's, a, it's, like, it's like a game, right? It's like the poet is playing a game. Huh? It's like a riddle. It's like a riddle. Or like a game where you have to find the tricks because there are lots of tricks in there and you have to, to see the poet's game. What's his game? Oh, his game is that he's inserting all these things in the text and they are meant for smart people, people who are curious, people who have like a critical mind, people who look for details and want to know everything, right? The search, the scrutinize everything. That's what he's doing. And he's sending you like uh, become a, to become a detective, because a literary critic is like a detective. They want to know the truth. That's what police do. When they investigate a crime, they're looking for the truth, right? The critic does the same. You get a story, you want to understand more than what the author is saying. But it's not just that, there is more, there is more to it. For example, uh, what, um, what novels did you study in uh, extensive reading last year? Out of this world. Those of you who were with me was out of this world. And I'm sure you had a bad experience. <laughs> right? See, some people love it. Anybody who studied something else? Did you take another novel? Anyone? Who was in another group with another teacher? Or the, did you? All of you were in my class? Yeah. Everyone? That's strange. It usually it doesn't happen like this. So, for example, you read the story of Out of This World, and you have these two characters speaking alternatively, one after the other. Remember that? Sophie and Harry, her father, and they're talking. And they're saying lots of things. But if you, just, if you read, you're not just reading the words. You want to, to understand the connections, the, why are they saying this? What's going on? What is the conflict? What happened? When did it happen? It's only later that we know that there was a single moment that was extremely important for Sophie. You know what that is? That really drive, drove her to hate her father once and for all and to go to America. Do you remember that? The car explosion with her grandfather in it died and her father took a picture. Yes, yes. Because for her, when her father did that, he took a picture of the explosion of his own father's car with him inside it, which is a big shock to her. It shocked her that her father did that because his, her father did not make a difference between his job as a photographer, right? And being a son and a father to this girl. Father from, you know, the son of his father. His father is dying, he forgot his family. He treats his own family as if he's treated, exactly the same as he's treating the people he takes pictures of when he goes to places, you know, to war zones, etc. That was amazing. And so you will only find that if, you're, you, if, you, if you are alert and looking at the details to find that moment. 
And when you find that, it says, oh, this is, this is the central moment in this novel. All, the, everything in the novel comes from this moment. All right? But this is not the only one. That's not the beginning. That comes somewhere in the end or in the middle, right? Almost towards, towards the end. But then we have another one. For example, the relationship with Harry and his own father. When did it begin? See, the detective that you should be, should be looking for this. As readers of literature, you should be looking for these questions. Where is it? Because once you discover somewhere, like a, an important moment, you say, this is one beginning uh, of something, and another beginning of something else, etc. And so you connect those dots, you are doing the exact same thing as a detective, as a good detective does, to find who is the criminal and how it happened. Right? That's why detective stories are extremely important in literature. That's extremely important. Because they, they, it's a, in criticism, it's, it's like an allegory of reading. A detective, you watch films, right? You watch series with detectives and you know, police, crimes, etc. And when you watch those, you are looking for, you know, those people are looking for criminals. And they want to understand how things happen. And, and good examples, they're not, not all of them are good. Some of them are really crappy. But some are really good. Like, for example, uh, do you know this old TV series called Colombo? This is like 70s and 80s. Colombo. It's an American series. Who's this uh, crazy detective? He's always wearing the same coat and he's always like, you know, with his big cigar. And, but it's funny. But there is another one that was in the 90s some time ago. It's called Monk. I don't know if any of you know about Monk. Monk, M-O-N-K, right? Monk is a detective, too. But he is a special kind of detective. But they are all copies. You see, all those stories are copies from one another. Monk is based on Colombo, right? Colombo has some, inspiration. not just inspiration, but he has as a person himself, he has like some craziness in him. And he's always talking about his wife. Nobody knows his wife. <laughs> but he's always saying, you see, my wife told me one day this, this, this. He starts conversations with his, about his wife, about his car, about stuff. You know, he's funny in that way. But then you look at Monk, you have something similar. Monk also has a problem. His wife died. And so he, he got like his psychological problem. He can't touch anything. He has to have like a person... Uh, a woman usually who comes with, uh, with uh, you know, those uh, wipes. Yeah? Every time he touches something, she gives him a wipe to wipe his hands because he's like scared of getting like germs. And so, and then, but when you look at that again, those stories, for example, are also based on Sherlock Holmes. Do you know Sherlock Holmes? They're based on the fiction, right? Sherlock Holmes is the, 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 is, uh, like the epitome of detectives, right? It started this thing. So, you can't be free of those influences, right? There is a book uh, by a critic, famous critic called The Anxiety of Influence. The Anxiety of Influence. It's the title of a book, you find you can read it. It talks about exactly the same thing. For writers, they are anxious not to be too much influenced by other writers, so they hide their work, right? Anxiety of Influence is extremely important. It, it addresses these questions, and so, Literary texts are made up of many things. Let me give you other examples about beginnings. Um, uh, okay. okay. I have another slide with this one again. So, when a text says immediately that it starts from the middle, not in the beginning, but in the middle. Stories that start in the middle. For example, we know that uh, Out of This World, the novel, starts in the middle. The first chapter is not the first chapter. It doesn't say, there was once a family, <laughs> The husband was named Harry, the father is Sophie, his grandfather is named, I don't remember, etc. And go on like that. It, that, that, that no. It's the introduction of the story. 
Yeah, it does and stuff like that. When, when Harry starts, he says, when this novel starts, I remember in 69, three years before he died, he died. Who is he? He says, before he died, and we don't know who's he. He never spoke about anyone. He says, I remember in 69, three years before he died, when I was home for a brief while in the summer, how we sat up together all night watching those first moon men, you know, the landing on the moon in 1969, take their first shy steps on the moon, etc. And so he starts in the middle of something. We don't even know it's the middle of the story or is it the middle of something else. Okay? So it's not the beginning. We call it starting in medias res. This is a Latin word for starting in the middle. Medias, in medias res. It's there, uh, somewhere. What is it again? Ah, it's there. And I should have put it in the time. Beginning in the middle is the other way to begin. One of the most famous beginnings in the middle is Dante's opening to the Divine Comedy. Some of you have mentioned the Divine Comedy. Dante, how many of you know Dante? Dante is a famous Italian poet. It's Dante Alighieri. He wrote this huge poem again. It's in three parts. Um, and it starts with Inferno. And you've seen the film called The Inferno. Purgatorio and Paradiso, right? Paradise, like hell, the purgatory, uh, uh, what's it called? The, what's the purgatory? The purgatory and paradise. So three positions in the afterlife, right? They correspond to the, you know, to, the, uh, to how afterlife is ap in, in according to religion. Uh, Christians, both Christian and the other, um, especially Christian because they are good. I don't know if there is an Islam purgatorio. I don't think there is. You think? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and the other one turned it into the Italian Christian, like Christianized, right? It, yeah. Uh, you know Abu Ala al Mari. Okay. Good. Because your friend mentioned Risalat Lofran is about this. It's about the same thing as this. And it's previous, and it came way before Dante. And Dante is supposed to be one of the most important Italian poets of all history, because this was like 14th century, right? 13th, 14th century, like uh, the 13th century. And beginning, it starts in Italian, but there is a, I will show you the. It was written in Italian. The first, time, the first thing that was ever written in Italian, Italian was not considered a language. At the time, Italian was, a, was a, what we call a dialect. And it was forbidden. Nobody was allowed to write in it. There was no writing in Italian. French did not exist. Spanish did not exist. I mean, they existed as dialects, but not as languages. Right? Dante united Italy by using the first time using Darija of Italy, which is the Italian language, the dialogue, as a national language. He used it as a language, and it became the language of Italy. Before it, everything, and even at the same time that he was writing, only Latin was the language of scholarship, of school, of religion, of politics, of science, of everything, it's Latin. And he wrote in Italian, which is a revolution at the time, right? Because he put Latin, on the map, it became like the language of Italy. Since then, Latin started to come. Same thing happened in Germany with Martin Luther. You heard about Martin Luther? Huh? The man who, who started the Protestant movement, he was protesting the, Gat the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was using only Latin and will not allow anyone to use any other language but Latin. And so Latin was the only language that was allowed. If you write something in any other language, you're persecuted, they will send you to jail, or maybe even kill you. But Martin Luther, he said, we have to write the Bible in the language that people can, can read and understand. It's the only way people can understand religion. If you give it to them in Latin, they will never understand. You can tell them anything, because they don't know Latin. Only a few people know the Latin. Right? The Latin language was only a language of an elite, of, uh, of the church, of the politicians, of the king, of the courts, etc., but not of the people. And people did not go to school. There were no schools. But they all spoke German. And so he decided that 
we should translate it into German so that people can actually read it and we can tell them and understand what it is. Otherwise, if it's in that language that they don't understand, you can tell them anything. Right? And the Catholic Church, of course, was not happy because it was guiding people by using they say, we are the ones who know. Right? The Catholic Church was saying, the priest and everything said, if you need anything about religion, come to us, we'll explain it to you. You don't need to think. You can't read Latin, so it's fine. We can explain it to you. But then they can give you their own ideology, their own things, whatever they want you to do. If they say, well, you have too much money. You have to give all your money because it says in the Bible that you should be poor. And as a religious person, you would say, okay, if that's what God wants, then take all my money. <laughs> that was what happened. And so this is the beginning of the German language becoming, a Germ uh, becoming the language of Germany. Since then, German started to be written and studied in schools, etc. And so, again, another revolution. Anyway, those are like history of how, how dialects, European dialects became languages that we know today. So, <clears throat> this, uh, this poem starts, like I said, in the middle because it's kind of meso is middle in Italian, by the way. Uh, what is the English language? Oh, it's here. Midway. See the word in itself. This is the first time. Midway in the journey of our life, I found myself in a dark wood for the straight way was lost. So everything here refers to middleness, to middle, 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 right? Everything is in the middle. Midway in the journey of my life. In other words, not in the beginning of my life, but in the middle of my life as a journey, because we refer to life as a journey in this world, right? He found himself in the middle of a dark wood, in the middle of a forest. So he is inside a forest. Because if you say, I found myself in a dark wood, that means a dark wood is is dark only when you are inside it. From outside, it's not dark because you're not in it, so. Right? And so, if you're lost on the way, it's because you have taken a way and then you're lost. You don't find your way back. So we are in the middle of something. That's so why he says, for the stray way was lost. He was in the middle of a forest, lost. And so everything here refers to a middle. The poem starts in the middle, and it talks about middles, right? The middle of his life, the middles of his, um, of his existence, the middle of his understanding in, of the world, etc. And so that's how it begins as well. There are three beginnings in there. There's the beginning of life, the beginning of the, the middle, uh, I'm sorry, beginning as the middle of life, the beginning also of the, uh, being in the middle of a forest, and also the middle of a road that can take him anywhere because he's lost. So they have these three. Um, and it's also the middle of a narrative, right? Um, when you, this poem here does not pretend to start from scratch. He says it's midway, etc. So he would start by talking uh, about midway of his life. He's not like from what we would expect an absolute beginning like when I was little or as a young boy, etc. But it starts in, in the middle. But it suggests then no absolute beginning, only strange originary middles. It's strange, it, it only um, um, suggests these middles as a beginning, right? It's middle is not, in other words, it's not the same as we've seen before, where Milton tries to start in the beginning. Milton was trying to start in the beginning because he's talking about the first disobedience of man. Right, remember? Only to realize that even that the poem, even though it tries to start in the beginning, it's not exactly the beginning because the beginning is before it, as we said. Okay, I'm not going back over that. But here it's a poem that says, okay, well, this is the middle. We are in the middle of something. I am in the middle of trouble. This is what he says in here because he finds himself in trouble. And he needs to understand where he's going uh, in his life. The whole journey is a journey, it's a spiritual journey because it's mystical, and he's going through the spiritual experience 
uh, where he is going to see heaven, to see people in hell, uh, in hell, sorry, the people in hell and hell, and, and he describes how they are in his imagination. Then the people are in the middle, in the purgatorial, uh, waiting to, for a decision either to go to hell or to go to, to paradise, to heaven, purgatory, and then the people who are in purgatory. Okay? Uh, And this goes with lots of things, because even in religious terms, when does life, be, I mean, scientific too, but let's talk about a religious sense of a beginning of a human life, of life, of you as an individual, of us. Where do you begin? Where does your life begin? You're when you're born. Okay? But so, before you were born, you did not exist. Yet you existed. You were somewhere. <laughs> right? You were somewhere, right? Yeah. Why? You were in your mom's womb, uh, right? <laughs> so you did, not, you did not come from nowhere. You were there. You existed. You were there. So that your life started nine months before you, you were born. Let's say that, right? But then, even then, even before that, where did you exist or not? Huh? At my father's. Yeah, you, you, you existed as a project in your parents' minds. They said, well, your parents decided that they want to have a child. So you exist before that. So when does your life begin? <laughs> Way back. <laughs> Way back. <laughs> in religion, because we have this thing called predeterminism, uh, it's like, if we take determinism, you understand determinism? Qadar, Qadariya. Qadariya, Qadariya. In other words, Muqaddar. Qadar, oh, you know that. Maktub, whatever, right? What? Each one of you, we are not here by, by uh, chance. I mean, God has already thought about this, maybe, right? In religion, it says, the, the logic is that we existed in, in, in God's mind before we exist. So when you're here, you were meant to exist. It's because you were meant to exist. In other words, you are the realization of a qadar. You are qadar, the realization, your materialization of a qadar. Al qadar being that you, that somewhere in, in God's book, there is someone who will be born to this person because they did that, right? So if you go that way, whenever you start your life, whenever you think about your life, you start in the middle. Like this poem, this is what the poem is about. We don't know where we start. We don't know where our life started. Did it start at birth? No. Did it start at the conception? In other words, the moment your, 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 your parents got together? Or did it start before? Or maybe it even started to the, with God. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, there will be a person named uh, Muhammad uh, something. Or Fatima something. <laughs> right? So the, you know, it goes back and back and back and back. And so it, it never ends. It's like going further and further and further and further. Which are allegories, again, of, relation, of, of uh, 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 literary texts. They're exactly the same thing. I will give you examples of that. So that paradox is what we will see with a famous book, a famous novel, called Chris Transhen. It's the, 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 the full title is long. It's The Life and, of, and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman. This is a, an 18th century novel. It was written in 1755. It was actually published in 19, 1759, as you can see there by Lawrence Stern. How many of you know this man? Lawrence Stern. This is the beginning of what we call the novel, right? The novel appeared, the first novel in England appeared with Defoe, with, with uh, Daniel Defoe, do you know that? Have you ever heard about Daniel Defoe? Do you know Robinson Crusoe? Robinson Crusoe, the man who was stranded on an island, and he found a guy called him Friday, and they lived together and some, until he was rescued. No? 
Yeah. You are studying literary criticism without knowing literature. <laughs> so it's hard to give you examples. Right? It's hard to give you examples. The first novels, it's, in other words, there was a tradition, there was something, a convention, something that existed at the time, where people wrote books, novels, published them for people to read them, for entertainment. Because there, was not, there were no TVs, there were no internet, no cinema, nothing. People had stories to tell. At night, especially in, in winter when the nights are long, people sat by the fire and read stories, read books. Right? And it was fun. And they found it fun. It's entertainment. They read them in houses, they read them in groups, in places, etc., etc. And so the novel was something like, you know, something that people buy because it's part of entertainment. And so the first novels were written then. This is also one of those people, one of those writers at the time who wrote these novels. And he wrote this book about this Tristram Shandy, who's a very bizarre character. And he starts his, poem, his, his book with a paradoxical beginning. Because most, at the time, stories were very conventional. You start with the beginning of a life of an author, of a, of a character, and you give their circumstances, and then you tell their story. In other words, there is like a very simple, realistic kind of story that starts with their birth, their life, etc., and their boyhood, their childhood, etc., and go on until their death or something. That was the traditional way of writing. But this man here decided that no. He says, my life did not start then. My life started at the conception. And he's basically saying that beginning of the novel says, I wish either my father or my mother, or indeed both of them, as they were in duty, both equally bound to it, had minded what they were about when they begot me when they had him. In other words, he's talking about, he's blaming for his life, because his life is miserable. He thinks his life is miserable. He says, what were they thinking? <laughs> what were my parents thinking when they created me? So for him, that's the beginning. Beginning is like a, a, a complaint about his father and but his parents fucking up his life. That's what he's saying. He says, I'm fucked up. My life is ruined <laughs> because of my parents. What were they thinking? Why did they get me? So he's very unhappy about his own life, right? He's not really uh, happy about that. And so the beginning here, again, goes back, right? And so we have received in the beginning again. <clears throat> so he complains that his father did not really plan his conception. He said, it, I just happened. These people did not even think about me. It's not like they, they didn't have a project, they didn't have a plan. No, they just got it. You understand? It just, he just happened by accident, like some people, you know, without thinking, well, it happened. And so, a woman is pregnant and she gives birth to a child. And he could be an unwanted child. Lots of people are like that. And he would have a miserable life because his parents did not want him, so they don't really care. They don't love him much. And so he feels that he, you know, his parents did not love him. And so he's not just, well, my parents just got me by accident. And so he's not happy about that either. Right. And his uncle says that later. I mean, in the, in the, in, in the novel, in the narrative, the, his uncle says, uh, my Tristram's misfortunes began nine months before, even, before he even came to this world. In other words, nine months even before he was born, you know, was at the conception. His misfortunes began because his parents did not really plan to have a child. It just happened. Okay? Um, so, beginnings in, in, in literary fictions are problematic most of the time, right? Uh, sometimes they promise something. Right? Because beginning is a premise of what's to come, of the story. For example, you say, let me tell you about this man. I'm already promising you that I'm going to tell you a story when I say that. Right? But if I don't say that and I say it differently, then I am seen, like we've seen before, in a context. Right? Beginnings refer to a context. 
because work starts with the context. You don't come out of nothing. Right? Even if I say, let me tell you, it's because I heard. Or, for example, there is this other beginning. Uh, let me give you some other examples. Um, for Mark Twain, this is even different. Mark Twain, you know Mark Twain? The man who wrote Tom Sawyer. Do you know Tom Sawyer? No? Huckleberry Finn. Two novels, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. They are two friends, two kids. One, one has a family, actually, in America. It's the beginning of American literature. And, and, and these are, fan, you know, like founding books, founding novels of American literature. And it's extremely important to know these characters. They're, I mean, they're fine because they turn them into, comic, into like, uh, uh, Cartoons, etc. But it's not. It's, it's more than. It's serious. It's it's funny, but at the same time, it's, it says a lot about how America began. Because it's all about how America was torn between two things. You have Tom Sawyer, who who lives in this Christian family with father and mother and everything, etc. With education, goes to school, does everything. And then there is Huckleberry Finn, this other kid who has no parents, who lives in the woods. And they are friends, and they're making lots of you know crazy stuff, going to places, having all these adventures, and so like America is like two things for for, for Mark Twain from his perspective. America began as a dual thing. It's like one that's wild. That's why you have the Wild West. Do you remember the Wild West? You know the, the idea of the Wild West, right? And you have also the other side, which is the one that is inherited from the colonies, from the British. Uh, you know, with like. Uh, social manners and uh, social habits, etc., and the civilization that is important from England or from Europe, etc. And so it's these two, and he's, you know, that, that's it. Well, if you don't read that stuff, I don't know, whatever. I can't tell you enough, because I don't know. Like I told you in the beginning, there is no beginning. We have to jump into things. So I'm saying all of these um, novels, I'm giving you the names of writers and novels and stories that you may or may not have heard about. But I have to. And there is, like I said, there is, if we want to start from the beginning, we will never start. <laughs> if we start from the beginning, we have to read, I don't know when. When, when can you start? So, there you go. So, um, uh, there is this one uh, about uh, Mark Twain. The beginning of his story, there is this, not this thing, this notice. And the says, say, persons attempting to find the motive in this narrative will be per prosecuted. In other words, if you look at that, he's talking to the reader. He's actually warning us. He knows we are going to find motive. He knows we are going to read the story. But he's saying this in a kind of funny, uh, mocking way. But at the same time, it's very interesting. He said, persons attempting to find the moral in it will be banished. <laughs> if you're trying to find the moral in the story, you will be banished. Right? Persons attempting to find a plot in it will be shot. <laughs> right? That's all the readers are looking for. You are looking for a plot, you're looking for a moral, you're looking for a motive, you're looking for all that stuff. And he's saying, but if you do that, I will kill you. <laughs> or I will banish you. Right? Or I will prosecute you. And he says here, by order, this is like a, this is like a decree, like a law. Right? And he says, by order, of the author, Sir G. G. Chief of Ordinance. In other words, he put in this, and it looks like a like an authoritative decree or law that was promulgated by the parliament or the government or something, and he is putting it there. Of course, he, this is ironic. It's all irony. In other words, this is exactly what he wants you to do, but he is telling you not to do it so you can do it. He knows that if I say don't do that, that's exactly what you're going to do. It's like children. Don't touch this, that's the first thing we will touch. Right? So he's like playing with us. And so the novel, the novel starts from this. Right? It starts with this. Even before it starts, it's already started. Because he's already telling you what not to do, knowing that you're going to do exactly that. Okay? This sentence is both an entrance and a barrier. Because it's marked as both. It's an entrance to the text and a barrier. Right? 
And, and we will talk about these things that come before the text. Like I showed you in this novel, of the title, the author, the dedication, all the information. Sometimes you find a list of illustrations, you can find uh, uh, even a glossary with words. Uh, you can find lots of things before the, you begin the novel. In fiction, you're not supposed to have those things. I mean, usually we don't expect that stuff to be too much. But we, before, you have to read all of those things. And they are like an entrance, like a threshold. Right? The threshold. You know, such a threshold. At the door, you have that. The doorstep, the doorstep where you go in. You start with that, because that's the entrance to the novel. But there are also like uh, something that stops you, because before you start reading the story, those things stop you first. Before you start reading Huckleberry Finn, you find this, and you have to read it. It stopped you from going straight to the story. Okay? So that stops you first. And then you read it, both as a, it stopped you from reading, but also it allows you to enter into the story with something in mind, knowing that the author forbids you to do certain things. And then you start thinking, should I do that? Is he serious? What am I going to do? And then you say, yeah, what is he going to do? Like he's going to do anything. <laughs> the man is dead. <laughs> I can read the novel. He can't pass him. He can shoot me. He can persecute me. He can vanish me because he's not even here. And I am not even in America. I'm in Morocco. So why do I have to care about what the author wants me to do or not to do? So and you go. But yet you have read that. And it made you think. And it stopped you for a minute or two. Then you start the novel. OK? And that's your beginning. It's a problematic beginning because it's, it doesn't start the story. But it starts something else. OK? <clears throat> uh, there is this other one, which is, again, interesting. Uh, no, I think I jumped one. Uh, no, what is it? Uh, I think it's not here. Mark Twain. Mervyn, Herman Melville, anybody knows Moby Dick? You know that? You have the book? You read it? Half the book? It's not an easy book, right? It's a big book, but it's also very, uh, very dense. You have to read a lot. You have to need uh, all kinds of dictionaries to read it because there's so many references in the book. And it's made on purpose. And it's done on purpose. Before you read that book, you have to go through so many definitions and illustrations and references to encyclopedias and things about whales, because it's about the whale, right? It's about whaling, right? It's, it, it's an allegory, but it's about whales. So we have to go through, uh, right, contents page. There is even a contents page in the book, in the novel. Normally, a novel doesn't have a contents page because, you know, it's, it's a story. And, and there is a dedication, there is an etymology, you know, all the words are explained, the history of the words, that are used in there. Then you have uh, extracts, sev several pages of quotations about it. Before you start the novel, you have all of these things to go through. Right? And these things like slows your pace. You want to read the story. It's like instead of watching the film, you stop to spend so much. The film begins with all the credits first. Usually the credits are at the end. Right? When you watch a film, at the end, there is lots of stuff that goes on, the names and the people who did whatever, etc., etc. Imagine that is in the beginning. Sometimes there are a few at the beginning, the names of the main character, the main actors, the director, the, the studio that made the film, the title of the film, etc. They come first, but those go quick. They don't take too much time. Right? But imagine that you are actually doing, seeing the whole end of the film in the beginning, which is like all these names and people who intervened, people who helped, assistants, assistants of assistants, I don't know, all kinds of stuff, pages and pages of that. What do you do? And you just want to watch the film. You skip, right? Because it's like obstacles. There are obstacles in your way. Except that here, they're not like that. It's in the novel here. You have this information that the author puts in there to explain or to give to the reader some knowledge about what he's going to talk about. 
knowing that, the, for example, the, the reader doesn't know much about the business of uh, fishing whales or hunting whales. And he gives pages and pages of, of quotes and what people said about whales, etc., to go gas them most of the time. Anyway, so that's, that's like, uh, th these are like the beginnings that are complicated and that do not make the text. And I'm saying, and I'm really uh, talking about where, what theory says about this, what we say about this in literary criticism. I've already started it, but I will give you a few uh, examples. <coughs> This is another one, Ford Maddox Ford. Uh, is an American writer, and he wrote this novel called The Good Soldier. And he starts, uh, this is the saddest story I have ever heard. When a narrator says this, what do you expect from that? It's a sad story. But he's already telling you what to think and how to feel. <laughs> Why does he do that? It's like he wants, he directs you. He direct, the, the, the narrator is directing you to be sad, to how to receive the story. He's telling you, this is a sad story. And by saying that, he's like prepared you to be sad. Or wants you, commands you actually, commands, like an order. Well, you have to find, this is a sad story, it will make you sad, right? But it says that's something else. It also says that the story is not his. He says, I've heard. So he's not inventing a story, but he heard the story. So what is the origin of the story? Where does it begin? Is it here? Or does it begin when somebody told him? Or does it begin when somebody invented the story? Or when it happened? So the beginning is unclear. Even though it starts with this, we don't know when it started. The beginning of the story is not there. It could be just a fiction, of course, but we can't know that. Because he said, this is the story I've heard. He gives us an assurance that he heard it. That it's a true story because he heard it. He's not inventing it. It's not his fiction. It's not his own invention. But he heard it from someone. Okay? So, again, like this delaying of beginning or deferral of beginning is extremely important because it makes you think of how to read the book. All of this is in order for you to be able to read the book in a different way. Because you have to, these are the things that are put there. And if we don't pay attention to them, we just go. We just read without paying attention. You start uh, out of the world as if it's a... Uh, but if you did not take time to think, why does it start like this? Why did Harry start saying, I remember in 1969 when he was, etc." Right? We don't, hmm? When he died, yeah. So we... That's a beginning, that's a problematic beginning. And in, in you readers as critics, because that's your job, when you write an, an essay about this novel, for example, for extensive re uh, reading last year, you were acting as critics. Some of you were good critics, some were not very good. I don't know. <laughs> but you have to think and act as critics by paying attention to all of these little details, even though the story may seem straightforward. Okay. <clears throat> now, these thresholds or doorsteps or whatever I call them that begin like citations, like the, what I saw with that uh, before, with like a, a etymology of words and all these, we call them, there is a French word, it's called piri text, something that, that surrounds the text or that precedes the text. There is a French uh, theorist, uh, his name is Gérard Genette, who calls them seuil, the seuil, l'ataba, a seuil. In English, it's a threshold, right? And he says, those are things, it's a technique. He says, those are tactics. There are things that authors put in order to control the reader, somehow, trying to, to direct the reader to how to read the text, how to think of it. Marcel Proust, how many of you know Marcel Proust? Marcel Proust is a, is a famous writer. He's French, as you can see from the name. <laughs> à la recherche du temps perdu. It's his, his oeuvre. It's not one, it's, it's one story, it's one long story, but it's like 12 books. 
It's one novel made of 12 books. It's like 3,000 pages. And he wrote it lying down. He was sick, he was dying. And he wrote, in English it translated as remembrance of things past, or lost time, or something. Different translations. But it's à la recherche des temps perdus. Like the searching for lost time, the search for lost time. And he wrote his memories of his life, and of the people, etc. Lots of it is fiction, of course. But he was lying down and writing that book. And he just remembers. Right? Um, but he says, the first line, he says, Je, uh, where is it? It's there. I can't find it. Yes, it's the second line. <laughs> Longtemps je me suis couché de bonheur. That's the beginning of his book. Longtemps je me suis couché de bonheur. Long, for a long time I used to sleep early. Longtemps, but it's, in French it, it's strange. It's the syntax is very bizarre. Longtemps je me suis couché de bonheur. You say that. It's a famous sentence. You know, I can hear it in, in literature, in literary discussions, etc. People say it all the time. And so, but then, he is remembering things, and memory works on repetition because it's memory. So beginning, the beginning is a repetition because now he's, he's repeating to us and to himself and in his mind what he has lived. So a beginning is a repetition of something here. It's not an absolute beginning of something. It is a repetition of something that has already begun or has already ended. So beginning as repetition, habits of memory, because that's what how it works. I mean, we remember things and we repeat them, because when you remember things, you are repeating them in your mind. Right? It's repetition. <clears throat> and so no single event can be called the beginning. You can't single out one event and say, this is the beginning. If you do that, it would be, you know, just like, uh, I don't know, like a, by chance or something. Now, let me uh, jump to, okay, you know, so we're talking about deferring, deferring the beginning, displacing the beginning, this is what I've been doing until now, deferring and displacing the beginning, or, or authorship also sometimes. Earlier I talked about uh, Cervantes and his work, and his novel, the Don Quixote, and in that one, he doesn't say that he was the one who wrote it. In 18th century English fiction, most writers said in the beginning of their novels that this is not my story. I did not create this story, but I was told this story. And that was a way of not taking responsibility for whatever can happen after the book is released. There was fear. You know, people would say, why did you write this? I said, no, I, I, just, I just told the story I was told or something I found in a manuscript which is the case of Don Quixote, because he says, I found a manuscript, Cervantes, the author says, I found a manuscript written by someone called Hamid bin Engeli or something, it's like a name, an Arabic name in Andalusia, in Spain, who wrote this story, so it's not me. I did not read it. And he doesn't want to take responsibility, of course, for whatever is said or, or written in the story. And so it's displacing both beginning and also authorship. He's not the author. So I'm not, it's not me. I'm not the author of this. I only heard it, like the other one. For my source saying, this is the saddest story I've ever heard. Which means I am not the author of this story. I only heard it from someone else. So I'm not responsible. If you don't like it, I'm not responsible. Remember what happened with Salman Rushdie? You know Salman Rushdie? Oh my God. You don't know Salman Rushdie? Wow, I can't give you any examples. The man was sentenced to death by Khomeini in Iran because he wrote the Satanic Verses. I'm sure you heard about that. A book called the Satanic Verses, Ayat Shaitania. It's a novel, huh? You heard about that? No, he was, well, he was, somebody tried to kill him. He's still alive. Yeah, but he wasn't, he didn't die. He is still in hospital, I think, yeah. Well, just a few weeks ago, 
when somebody attacked him in, in America. He lives in America. He lived in England for a long time in hiding. He was had, under police protection for years. And then he went to America because he couldn't take it anymore. So he left and started living. He is from India, and he wrote a novel called The Satanic Verses, and people did not like it in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iran, in Egypt, in many countries. And even in this country, people don't like it. No, he was not. No, that's not true. Well, I mean, that's what people read in it, because people don't know how to read. <laughs> people read whatever they want to read in it. But it's not, it's not exactly that. But he is more criticizing some of the things. But anyway, that's not the, sub the subject of discussion. It's because people made him responsible for this say. He says, you said that. Even though it's just a fiction, they said, you are responsible for every word and for every idea in there. So it's all yours. This is how you think. And you are a bad man. And so they decided that he should be killed. Right? Until the other day, someone tried to kill him. So that's why in the past, people, for example, in 18th century novels, writers always said that this story is not mine. This story is something I heard. This story was given to me by someone. Because they did not want to take responsibility for that. Hey, this is not a how come? Anyway, so <clears throat> we have five minutes and I intend to use it. Okay, don't worry. In five minutes you leave. It's five to ten to twelve. Uh, just for those of you who are always who are used to teachers who leave you, uh, let you go after fifteen minutes of uh, the beginning of the class. I don't do that. I if you have two hours, you have two hours, right? So get used to it. <laughs> You don't leave. Unless, unless I decide otherwise, you will stay until 12. If you want to leave before 12, you're free to go. But please don't come, if that's what you want. Anyway, we talk about, let me just jump to things that are, I, I'm going to jump to skip a few things. That's our right? So I did not want to start with, Text to intertextuality and explain it as a theory, was that a theoretical concept? But I wanted to give you all these examples, then I give you the idea for it. It's called intertextuality. That's when texts are mingled. Texts used within other texts, consciously or unconsciously, every text rewrites other texts. This is what the idea of intertextuality is, right? And here is this well known essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent. T.S. Eliot, do you know T.S. Eliot? Anyone? No. T.S. Eliot is a famous American poet, right, who wrote this famous piece called The Wasteland. It's a long poem again. And he's also a critic because he wrote lots of uh, things other, other than poetry and, and drama. And in, in one of these essays called Tradition and the Individual Talent, in one of those, he says this. He says, no poet, no artist of any art, of any art, right, has his complete meaning alone. In other words, you can't write in a void or out of nothing. No one, no artist of any art has his meaning alone, creates his meaning alone. It always, you are writing within it. When you write short stories, you're writing within the tradition of short stories. Right? So it is extremely important that you know that. Rather, what is important is the poet's relation to the dead poets, to the, to the past poets, let's say, and artists. What is important is your relation to the others. Because you can't write on your own, but you have to admit that there is influence. Right? And that's what we mean by intertwine, because the texts that you have read before intervene even if it's not directly, most of the time indirectly, but they intervene in your own texts. And so when you read an, uh, like examples I gave you, all the texts that we saw, the, the examples we saw, apart from the fact that they send us to different beginnings, they also send us to different texts that were beginnings of something. And so they are all mingled into the text. They are all there. They're present, right? Text comes from the word, what is the text? Huh? 
Combination of words. Yes, it is a combination of words. But where's, in which industry do we use the word text? There is an industry in which the word text exists. And it's the image that counts. Textile. Textile industry. You know what's textile industry? I sometimes wonder if you, I don't know. Why have a textile? Textile. Nasij. Nasij. What is nasij? How do you get nasij? What do you do when you nasij? I don't even know how to say that. When you weave, because it's weaving. Huh? You bring threads, right? This, that, whatever you're wearing is the result of multiple threads put together by a machine or by human hands into a piece of cloth. If you open it, it comes in threads, right? Yes or no? It's all like that. It's not one piece, this is not one thing, it's lots of lines, lots of threads made of cotton, right? So it's fine, different colors. And everything. So we put them together in order to make one piece of cloth. Huh? A tissue. A tissue is part, is a mixture of things. And text is exactly that. A literary text, a good text, is exactly that. Made of other texts. We can't see, we can't see them. When you look at your shirt, you see only one piece, right? You see just the cloth. But if you try to analyze the whole thing, you find that there is actually, if you have like a big microscope, and you put it there, you would see that there are lots of lines, and lines within lines, you know, threads, uh, knot together, put together, etc. And Nessie is this, textuality is this. So text, literary texts are like that. They're made up of other texts. Just like a piece of cloth is made up of lots of other pieces of, of, of threads, and the threads being the text for the text that we are talking about. That's what intertextuality is. Okay? The text is plural. Well, this is one of us. I told you about the French uh, structural, structuralist critic. The text is plural. It is a tissue of fabric woven with citations. Woven, like weaving, right? Weaving, nasij, right? With citations, references, echoes, cultural languages that make it anonymous and traceable. Right? The text is always, this is anonymous, which prepares us for something that he will say later, which says there is no author. He says the author is dead. In a text, when the text is finished, the author is dead. Right? Because the text is not totally his. It's not the author. There is not one author. There are millions of authors. Because what an author does is bringing together many things and putting them together. Not copying, not stealing, not doing it on purpose. It's just like that. This is how it is. Right? This is a position that can be criticized. You may not agree with it. I don't agree with it 100%. But that's a theory, right? Okay. And the text reads without its author. He is present just as one of its characters, no longer privileged pat uh, uh, paternal. The text asks from the reader a practical collaboration. That's what you were doing, that I was doing with those texts, with the, you know, the poems that I was looking at. Your collaboration, the text asks you to collaborate, to work, not to just to receive it without thinking, or just like that. It's not like a film. It's not like video that you watch. It's all done for you, you have nothing to do. Just sit down and think, it's a stupid thing. You just sit and watch and consume. That's what you do with Instagram. You're sitting there and just pushing. The only thing that works is your finger, your, your thumb, pushing the things up to see the pictures or the videos, right? That's what you do, right? With Instagram, it's done. you don't even use your minds because you're only using your eyes and that thing. And so it's, that's what stops you from reading, by the way. <laughs> if you spend hours doing that, you will have no time to, to read a, a boring paper with lots of words on them. This is like really off-putting. Take my phone, I want to watch something else. <laughs> That's what you do, right? Okay, so uh, that's enough, okay? See you next week with something different. And by the way, I don't have any polycopia or anything. There is nothing to read. So it's all here. <laughs> <laughs>